They call me a cleaner. Sounds less ominous, less messy than the truth. See, I don't deal with your run-of-the-mill human filth. The bloodstains you can scrub out, the crimes you can cage. Those have an order to them, a twisted logic. My work, it's tidying up a different kind of mess. The office is the same as any. Cheap coffee with a metallic bite. Buzzing fluorescent lights you try to tune out. Stacks of files threatening to breed and take over the space. It's the perfect cover. No one glances twice at a man in a rumpled suit drowning in paperwork. Even if a faint, sulfurous stench clings to him some days. Easier to write me off as another cog in the machine. They don't see the scorch marks seared into the walls of interview room B, the way the clocks in there melt, or the permanent chill seeping out from under the door. They sure as hell don't understand why the senior agents, the old-timers with the thousand-yard stare, have a betting pool on whether I make it a year. My first case, I was barely out of training. Rookie, all nerves and idealism. Thought I was changing the world, cleansing it of evil. That was before I saw what they really are. Not the monstrous, slavering things they put in movies. No claws or fangs, no glowing eyes or grotesque mutations. Most times they look like us, walk like us. Some days maybe they even feel a bit like us. If they weren't parasites, you might mistake them for the ordinary man driven mad. See, the thing they don't put in the manuals is that they aren't physical. Not really. They slip in through the cracks, the negative spaces. Anger, fear, despair. They latch onto those emotions, gorge themselves until the person's hollowed out, just a husk going through the motions. Then they jump ship, leaving behind enough misery to fuel another and another and another. Tracking them is less science, more instinct. I've learned to read the signs. A sudden uptick in road rage cases. A city councilman losing his mind on live TV. An unexplained suicide cluster at a prestigious college. Where the human psyche fractures into chaos, that's where you find their feeding grounds. My job is threefold. First, the hunt. You sense the taint, a wrongness under the skin of reality. It's like a cold draft snaking its way down your spine, making the hairs on your neck stand up. The closer you get, the worse it feels. Then the snare. We don't talk about the tech. Part of it's classified, the other part… Well, you try explaining to a civilian how you pull something out of a person's soul without breaking their brain. Let's just say it involves electromagnetism, induced psychic dissonance, and more than a few sleepless nights on my part. Finally, the cleanup. The part no one wants to think about. Sometimes, there's too much damage. The host is gone just an empty vessel. That's when it falls to us. No room for sentimentality in this line of work. A quick, efficient end is the most merciful thing we can offer. They tell you it gets easier. It doesn't. The faces change. The methods tweak. But the rot at the core, that gnawing certainty that darkness is real and far closer than we like to admit, that stays with you. Stains your soul darker than any of the slime I extract from the infected. Maybe that's why the betting pool exists. They're not betting on whether I'll break doing this job. We all break sooner or later. They're betting on what kind of broken I'll become. The fluorescent lights buzzed like angry wasps as I stared at the file clutched in my hand. Another missing person case. Another potential feeding ground. This one involved a young stockbroker. David Miller vanished from his posh high-rise apartment without a trace. No forced entry, no struggle. Just a sterile silence and a growing sense of unease among his colleagues. The brass wouldn't classify it a priority. Missing adults were a dime a dozen in the city. But I felt it in my gut, a low thrumming unease. The report mentioned whispers of paranoia among Miller's team in the days leading up to his disappearance, a sudden shift in his usually calm demeanour. Bingo. My partner, Davies, a grizzled veteran with a perpetually haunted look, caught me grimacing as I stuffed the file into my bag. New case? He rasped, 
his voice roughened from countless cigarettes and too many encounters with the things we hunted. Stockbroker with a sudden case of the jitters, I said, trying to inject a lightness that didn't quite sit right. Think it's worth a look? Davy sucked on his cigarette, exhaling a plume of smoke that danced in the stale air. Your call, kid. But remember, missing doesn't always mean a feeder. He had a point. Sometimes the darkness was just regular darkness, the absence of light rather than an entity actively draining it. But I still felt the pull, that unseen tug towards something rotten. Let's head to the precinct, I sighed, grabbing my coat and heading for the door. We kept the office spartan, devoid of personal effects. It helped maintain the illusion that we were just another cog in the bureaucratic machine, another pair of tired eyes sifting through paperwork. Little did they know, the real action happened after hours in the shadowed corners reality tried desperately to keep hidden. The precinct was a cacophony of controlled chaos. We weaved through a maze of cubicles, the air thick with stale coffee and desperation. The officer assigned to Miller's case a young man with nervous energy bouncing off him, perked up at the sight of our badges. Agents, he stammered, fumbling through a stack of papers. David Miller, case file here. No leads, I'm afraid. Can we speak with his colleagues? I asked, already feeling the familiar itch of anticipation crawl under my skin. The interview with Miller's team left me disoriented, a jumble of nervous glances and carefully worded phrases. Words like, Erratic, paranoid, and a worrying undercurrent of something unspoken. A fear so deep it choked the air out of the room. As we left, Davies leaned close, his voice a low rumble. They're scared, he said, confirming my suspicions. Scared of something, he might have said. Something impossible. We were in the car, the city lights blurring into a neon smear outside the window when I felt it. A sharp jab of anxiety? No, it was deeper, more primal. Fear, not human fear, but the base, raw terror of someone cornered, desperate. It was faint, but unmistakable. There! I hissed, slamming my fist on the dashboard, startling Davies. That's it! That's the feeder's trail! We traced the signal to a rundown apartment building tucked away in a forgotten corner of the city. Every instinct in me screamed caution, but there was no time for second-guessing. This was a live feed, a rare opportunity to catch one of these things red-handed. We entered the building cautiously, the stench of damp concrete and garbage assaulting our nostrils. The air grew heavier with each floor we climbed, the oppressive silence broken only by the ragged thump of a distant heartbeat. On the third floor we found the source, a small, dingy apartment with the faint glow of a TV illuminating the cracked window. Davies flipped a switch on his belt buckle, a subtle hum filling the air. It was the signal disruptor, meant to weaken the feeder's hold on its host. I kicked in the door. Inside, a man huddled on the floor, his face a mask of terror as he stared at the TV screen. Static danced interspersed with dark images that defied description. The man's eyes, unnaturally wide, reflected the horror. He wasn't David Miller. This was someone else, an innocent caught in the crossfire. This wasn't a clean case. This was a mess. Hold on, I rasped, drawing my sidearm, the familiar way to cold comfort in this situation. Davies, get the tech ready. The man on the floor began to convulse. His body twisted into a horrifying distortion, screams tearing from his throat. I saw the glint of something in the half-light, something serpentine, shifting within him. A segmented body just beneath the skin. Time seemed to slow. Davies was fumbling with the snare device, his hands unsteady. I knew we were running out of time. If this man turned completely, I'd have no choice. Cleanup wasn't just for the victims beyond saving. Sometimes you had to stop the infection from spreading. Davies, I shouted, my voice ragged. Just when I thought I might have to pull the trigger, the snare hummed to life. A wave of dissonant energy washed over the room, the creature within the man recoiling in visible agony. The convulsing stopped and the man slumped to the floor, gasping. 
I knelt beside him, checking for a pulse. Weak, but steady. It was a gamble, but the snare must have dislodged the feeder before it took full hold. Extraction complete, Davies reported, his voice carrying a note of relief. He held a small metallic cylinder, its sickly yellow-green light flashing steadily. Inside the creature writhed, its existence a testament to the horrors lurking at the periphery of our world. We didn't have the time to wait for backup. I slung the unconscious man over my shoulder, the sting of exertion mixing with the lingering adrenaline still coursing through me. Let's go, I muttered to Davies. This place is compromised. Back at the agency, the infected man lay comatose in a starkly lit observation room. The techs hovered over him, monitoring vital signs and running scans. My shift was technically over, but I couldn't tear myself away. The head of the medical division, Dr. Eisner, a sharp-eyed man with thinning hair and a perpetual frown, approached me. Lucky break, he grunted. Most of the time, we don't get to them in time. He's not out of the woods yet, I reminded him. We'll keep a close eye on him. If he pulls through, the amnesia protocol will kick in, Eisner said, a note of coldness in his voice. Better than the alternative. He didn't need to finish that sentence. We both knew what the alternative was. Some part of me couldn't help but wonder if amnesia was truly a mercy in the end. Forgetfulness might be easier than the knowledge that monsters exist and feed on the worst in us. That darkness isn't just out there, it's inside us too. Leaving the agency, the world outside felt impossibly sterile. The harshness of reality muted after a night spent towing the line between sanity and the abyss. I craved the oblivion of sleep, yet I knew it would offer little respite. The creature, trapped within its prison, and the face of the man who almost became a monster, would haunt my dreams. As I walked home, the shadows seemed just a little bit deeper, the city's pulse a little less certain. This job, this hidden war, it changes something in a man, carves out bits of your soul piece by piece, replacing them with a chilling cynicism. You start seeing horrors everywhere, lurking beneath the veneer of a normal life. Maybe that's the worst kind of darkness, the kind you start to see in yourself. Sleep offered no sanctuary. The sterile white of the observation room replayed on repeat behind my eyelids, punctuated by flashes of the writhing creature and the hollow fear in the rescued man's eyes. Reality, however, offered little respite either. The office was its usual depressing self, the fluorescent lights buzzing overhead like angry wasps. Davies sat slumped in his chair, eyes narrowed at the screen of his terminal. He looked up as I entered, the fatigue etched into his face, mirroring my own. Anything good on Miller? I asked, the name leaving a bitter taste in my mouth. Davies grunted, shaking his head. Vanished without a trace, no security footage, no leads, just a ghost in a fancy apartment. Missing a person was bad. Missing someone after an encounter with a feeder, well, it didn't bode well. There was a chance, however slim, that the creature hadn't completely latched on to Miller. A chance he might be running, paranoid and desperate, his very essence tainted by the encounter. We need to widen the search, I said, pushing the remains of a stale donut around my plate. Focus on reports of sudden fear, paranoia, anything out of the ordinary. It wasn't perfect, but it was all we had. Our technology was primitive at best, a cobbled together mess of science and desperation. The snares, the disruptors, they were effective, but only in close proximity to the feeders. Tracking them across a sprawling city like ours was a crapshoot. The rest of the morning was filled with reports, interviews and dead ends. The afternoon brought a surprise visitor, Agent Thompson, the head of our division. A man built like a bull with a perpetually grim expression, he didn't waste time with pleasantries. The council wants answers, he growled, his voice like gravel scraping against concrete. Another feeder running loose, another close call. They're not happy. The council, a shadowy group of powerful individuals who funded our operations, remained shrouded in secrecy. We were their blunt instruments, their cleaners, tasked with keeping the existence of the feeders under wraps and preventing a mass panic. We're working on it, I said, keeping my voice steady. 
The rescue last night brought us some valuable intel. Intel? Thompson scoffed, raising a skeptical eyebrow. Another wriggling monstrosity in a jar, big whoop. We need to find a way to stop them at the source agent, before they latch onto anyone else. His words hung heavy in the air. Stopping them at the source. That was the million-dollar question. The whispers, the rumors among the old-timers spoke of a place beyond, a nexus where the feeders congregated, a festering wound in the fabric of reality. But those were just stories, whispered in the dead of night. Dangerous, unsubstantiated tales that hinted at a battle we were vastly unprepared to fight. We'll keep digging, I said finally, meeting Thompson's gaze. But it's not going to be easy. He grunted in acknowledgement, then turned and strode out of the office. His visit left a heavy silence in its wake. The weight of responsibility pressed down on me, a suffocating cloak. This wasn't just about saving people anymore. It was about keeping the city, the world, safe from a nightmare it couldn't even begin to comprehend. As the day wore on, a sense of unease gnawed at me. It wasn't just the pressure from the council or the lingering memory of the rescued man's haunted eyes. It was something else, a prickling sensation beneath my skin, a feeling that we were missing something. Finally, just as the last sliver of sunlight bled from the city windows, a detail in the Miller case report snagged my attention. A seemingly innocuous note about a recurring image in his colleagues' descriptions. A symbol, a distorted sigil they couldn't quite place. Davies, still hunched over his terminal, caught the shift in my posture. Did you find something? he asked. I pushed the file towards him, pointing to the highlighted section. This symbol? Miller's colleagues mentioned it too. They couldn't quite describe it, but... Davies squinted at the faded photocopy. Then slowly, recognition crossed his face. Wait a minute. I've seen that somewhere before. He scrambled through a stack of dusty files, muttering under his breath. Finally, he pulled out a tattered document, its edges yellowed with age. Sprawled across the page, faded but unmistakable, was the same distorted sigil. Restricted file, Davies muttered recovered from a cult raid over a decade ago. A group called The Seekers. They were into some weird stuff, rituals, talk of tapping into other dimensions. He looked up, his face grim. And that symbol. It was their calling card. A cold shiver ran down my spine. A cult? Could a bunch of misguided humans be responsible for summoning these interdimensional parasites? The thought, while absurd, held a grain of terrifying plausibility. Miller's apartment, I said, realization dawning. Was there any indication of cult activity? Nothing in the police report, Davies replied, frowning. But maybe we weren't looking for the right signs. A fire ignited within me, a desperate need to find answers. Get Thompson on the phone, I ordered, my voice cracking with urgency. We need to revisit Miller's case. Now! Armed with Thompson's reluctant approval, we raced back to the city, the urgency propelling us like a machine running on fumes. Miller's apartment building loomed in the encroaching darkness, a silent testament to its missing occupant. As we re-entered the apartment, the stench of sulphur, faint at first, grew stronger. It wasn't just the residue of the feeders passing, something else was here, a lingering presence that crawled along my skin. Tech, I barked at Davies, nodding towards the spare room. He was already on it, setting up equipment with meticulous care. Years of silent partnership made for efficient communication in tense moments. The room was sterile, untouched by the police. On the surface, it could have belonged to any young professional. But the more I looked, the more things seemed off. A slight warping of the floorboards beneath a rug a geometrical pattern in the grain of the wood that was almost too perfect, an asymmetry in the wall hangings that set my teeth on edge. And there it was, the distorted sigil, faintly etched on the underside of the desk, practically invisible to the naked eye. Davies looked up from his scanner, eyes wide. It's broadcasting a signal, weak but consistent. It's a beacon. 
Find the source, I said, my voice tight. Miller wasn't infected, he was the lure. We ripped the apartment apart, tearing up floorboards, peeling back wallpaper. Finally, behind a loose panel at the base of the wall, we found a crude device. This is it, I whispered, dread and a twisted sense of triumph warring within me. They used Miller to open a doorway. We have to follow it. I looked at Davies, his grizzled face drawn but resolute. He understood the implications of what I was suggesting. To confront these creatures in their own territory, it was tantamount to suicide. But what choice did we have? Letting them open portals at will was an invitation to disaster. Prep the gear, I said, a grim determination settling over me. We're going in. Back at the agency, the portal lab was bathed in a blue light. Technicians hovered nervously, whispering in hushed tones. Thompson stood by, his bulky frame radiating disapproval. This is reckless, he boomed. You don't even know what's on the other side. That's exactly why we need to go, I snapped back. We can't let them have the initiative. The portal itself was a swirling vortex, an impossible churning void that crackled with energy. I could feel it pulling at me, a hunger that went beyond mere physics. It took every ounce of willpower to step towards it, let alone through it. Ready? I asked Davies. He nodded, his face a mask of grim determination. He went through first, swallowed whole by the void. A second later I followed. The world dissolved into a blinding maelstrom of colours and sensations. Nausea threatened to engulf me, my insides churning like a washing machine on high spin. Claws dug into my shoulders, Davies, his grip the only anchor in this kaleidoscope of madness. Then, abruptly, the chaos stopped. We found ourselves on a platform of smooth, cold stone, bathed in an alien light. The air vibrated with a low hum that resonated deep within my bones. Jagged black mountains speared a blood-red sky, devoid of stars. The ground beneath us was littered with skeletal shapes, bleached white under the harsh, unnatural light. It was a landscape of desolation, the very antithesis of life. Davies coughed, and for the first time I noticed the blood staining his sleeve. A thin, jagged gash ran across his arm. Great, I muttered, fumbling with my medkit. Just what we needed. Space souvenirs. The alien biology seemed to be messing with the wound, preventing it from clotting. I applied a pressure bandage, hoping it would be enough. We need to move, I said, urgency lacing my voice. Find the source, shut it down, and get the hell out of here. We set off cautiously, boots crunching on the bone-strewn ground. The silence here was even worse than the alien hum, broken only by our own breath. We moved like shadows, constantly scanning our surroundings for any sign of movement. The landscape seemed to twist and shift ever so slightly, like a mirage in the heat. Just when I started to feel like we were walking in circles, a monstrous silhouette emerged from the jagged skyline. It was a creature of pure nightmare, a writhing mass of tentacles and glistening black flesh. It emanated a putrid stench that made my eyes water. Fear, raw and primal, surged through me. But there was no room for panic. I raised my sidearm, a paltry weapon against such an entity. Davies did the same, his face grim. Looks like we found the source, he rasped. Get ready to shoot our way out of this one. Before the creature could react, we opened fire. The bullet slammed into its viscous flesh, leaving smoking holes that quickly regenerated. The creature lashed out with a whip-like tentacle, knocking me off my feet. Dazed, I watched it tower over Davies, its maw opening to reveal rows of razor-sharp teeth. My heart hammered against my ribs, each beat a deafening thunder in the desolate silence. Just when I thought it was over, a sound cut through the air, a high-pitched whine followed by a blinding flash of light. The creature shrieked, its form convulsing as the light seared into its flesh. I blinked, temporary blindness clearing slowly. Between me and the creature stood a figure shrouded in a cloak. Its form shifted like a half-remembered dream, impossible to discern in the harsh light. 
In its hand, it held a device that hummed with a familiar energy. The snare. It was Agent Thompson, his face grim, his eyes burning with an unnatural intensity. Foolish agents, he rasped, his voice distorted by an inhuman inflection. You had your orders! Containment, not confrontation! He turned to the creature, which writhed and thrashed in its death throes. Without hesitation, he plunged the snare into its writhing mass. A deafening shriek tore through the air, then abruptly ceased. Only a faint wisp of smoke remained. We need to go, Thompson said, his voice returning to a semblance of normalcy. This breach won't hold for long. He extended a hand towards me. Dazed and injured, I could only nod in agreement. He helped me to my feet, then propelled us both forward in a way that defied gravity. One moment we were on the desolate platform. The next we were hurtling through the swirling vortex of the portal. The return journey was mercifully brief. We emerged back in the lab, the technicians staring at us with slack jaws. Thompson deactivated the portal, his face pale despite his earlier bravado. Get Agent Davies to medical, he barked at a technician. And you, he turned to me, his voice dropping to a low growl. Clean up yourselves and write a report. Don't forget a single detail. He stormed out of the lab, leaving me with a churning stomach and a head full of unanswered questions. What had happened to Thompson on the other side? How had he acquired a snare? And perhaps most importantly, why did a chilling suspicion start to form in the back of my mind? The suspicion that he wasn't simply trying to contain the threat anymore. The agency's medical wing smelled perpetually of bleach and despair. Davies lay on a sterile bed, his injured arm carefully stabilized, but his face was even paler than usual. The doctor, a severe man with a perpetual frown, hovered beside him. The cut itself was minor, he explained, but the contamination, it's not responding to conventional treatment. We're doing everything we can, but he didn't have to finish. I understood, that wasn't a regular wound. It was a festering reminder of the nightmare world we had stumbled into, a wound that carried the seeds of otherworldly decay. Hours turned into days. I spent them at Davies's bedside, writing the incident report while a gnawing unease festered within me. Thompson wanted detail. He'd get it. Every horrific moment etched into my report, along with the lingering questions simmering beneath the surface. I couldn't ignore what I'd seen, what had changed in Thompson's eyes. There was no word from the council, an ominous silence that spoke volumes about their priorities. Davies remained unconscious, his breathing shallow, his skin taking on a sickly pallor. I knew deep down that we were losing him. Another casualty of a war no one dared acknowledge existed. On the fifth night, I sat hunched at my desk, poring over case files, searching for some connection, some hint of a larger pattern I might have missed. Then it hit me. The Seekers, the cult we'd stumbled upon in the Miller investigation. They talked of rituals, of opening doors to other dimensions. What if these weren't just unhinged ravings? And what if Thompson, driven by a desperation born from too many years battling an unseen enemy, what if he had taken their mad theories as truth? I closed my eyes, the pieces spinning into place with terrifying clarity. He'd used Miller to create the beacon. He'd gone into that monstrous dimension deliberately. And now, Davies was slowly dying from the taint he'd brought back. It wasn't about containment anymore. Thompson was experimenting, trying to understand these creatures, maybe even control them. The idea sent a shiver of dread down my spine. We were not just hunters in this hidden shadow war. We were the hunted, the unwitting subjects in a monstrous experiment. And our fearless leader, he'd crossed the line. A line I feared it was too late to pull him back from. Sleep eluded me that night. I stared at the ceiling light and contemplated the impossible choices ahead. Do you report a monster to the higher-ups, the shadowy council who might themselves be just as corrupt? Do you risk it all to try and stop a man who might hold the only key to fighting back? Or was it already too late? The darkness, as always, held no easy answers. The only certainty was the weight of a dreadful revelation. The fight against these interdimensional parasites 
had never been about saving the world. It was about surviving long enough to see what kind of monster you'd become in the process. Days passed. Visiting Davies was a torture I endured. Each visit a confirmation of my worst fears. The alien contamination gnawed at him from within. His human body a crumbling battleground in a war against an unseen foe. The agency doctors whispered their theories, testing increasingly desperate experimental treatments, none of which offered a glimmer of hope. Meanwhile, Thompson moved like a ghost through the halls of the agency. Gone was the gruff, pragmatic commander I knew. In his place, a man consumed by some new obsession, his eyes sunken and alight with a strange hunger. My report, painstakingly crafted over bloodless nights, lay untouched on my desk. It was both my confession and my accusation. A damning document that could potentially destroy everything we'd built. But submitting it, with no way to prove my suspicions, would be career suicide at best. And at worst, might bring the full weight of the Council's wrath down upon my head. Fear gnawed at my insides, a constant companion to the anger and despair. Davies had been my partner, my rock against the constant barrage of nightmares. Now, I watched helplessly as the light faded from his eyes. The darkness seeping into him until all that remained was a husk, a shadow of his former self. That's when the plan, if you could even call it that, started to form. It was born of desperation, fueled by rage. Thompson was playing God in a realm where no mortal belonged. I wouldn't stand by and watch. Certainly not if there was a slim chance to stop him before it was too late. The agency, for all its secrecy, was still bound by the laws of technology. There were security logs, tracking devices, and monitoring systems. With a bit of stealth, and maybe some luck, I might be able to retrace Thompson's steps, uncover where he was staging his monstrous experiments. After Davies's death, his passing was clinical, a relief more than a tragedy at that point. I spent my nights slipping through shadows, accessing restricted files, and dodging watchful technicians. It was a dangerous game, one I'd lose if caught. But the risk didn't matter. I was already a dead man walking, just waiting for the other shoe to drop. Then, amidst the dry technical reports and cryptic data, a pattern emerged. Power surges in the auxiliary lab, equipment requisition orders signed by Thompson himself for items that had nothing to do with our usual operations. And most damning of all, a hidden access log to the portal lab that showed activity on nights when it was supposedly dormant. I had my proof. Thompson wasn't just using our technology, he was perverting it, bending the very tools meant to protect humanity into a weapon no one could comprehend. The night I decided to act was a Wednesday, unremarkable in every way but one. Thompson was a creature of habit, drawn to his experiments like a moth to the flame. It was his hubris, ultimately, that would give me that sliver of opportunity I so desperately needed. I waited in the shadows outside the portal lab. Time dripped by, an agonizing, sweat-filled eternity. Then, the door creaked open. Thompson slipped inside, his bulky frame silhouetted by the sickly portal glow. With a silent prayer to a god I wasn't sure even existed, I followed. Inside, the air crackled with a tension that sent my senses into overdrive. Several large metal containers lined one wall, their contents unknown and unknowable. But it was what lay on the central lab table that made my blood run cold. A creature, not like anything I'd encountered before. Smaller, its form shifting and amorphous, almost gelatinous. It quivered weakly within a containment field, a pathetic shadow of the Leviathan we battled on that alien wasteland. Its presence felt less like a threat, more like a vile experiment. Thompson stood over it, the snare held aloft in his hand. His voice, when he spoke, rang out in the sterile space. It carried a new inflection I didn't like. We're close now, he murmured, seemingly to himself. Just a little further, a little more understanding and we will harness their potential. 
He turned the snare in his hands, his eyes fixated on the writhing creature. Harness their potential. The statement chilled me more than any monstrous apparition could. In his obsession, Thompson had lost sight of the horror he was dealing with. To him, these creatures weren't abominations to be eradicated. They were tools, a means to an end. I had to act, now. I raised my sidearm, took aim, one shot clean and quick. My heart hammered against my ribs, time slowing down. Just as my finger twitched on the trigger, an alarm blared, shattering the silence. Thompson whirled, eyes blazing. How? he roared. You followed me! Before I could answer, before I could even process the fact that I'd been discovered, the creature on the table let out a piercing shriek. The containment field crackled and sputtered, and then, with a surge of unnatural energy, it burst. The lab exploded into chaos. The unleashed creature writhed and thrashed, its gelatinous body expanding, then contracting with impossible speed. Its shriek was a psychic assault, a wave of pure terror that crashed into my mind, threatening to shatter my sanity. Thompson, momentarily stunned, fumbled for the snare device. I lunged forward, desperate to wrestle it from his grasp. We slammed into a stack of equipment, monitors crashing to the floor in a cascade of glass and sparks. The creature, fueled by its sudden freedom, shifted and flowed, tentacles lashing out and tearing into the lab walls. As the room dissolved into a whirlwind of destruction, I caught a glimpse of its form changing, hardening into jagged, razor-sharp edges. It was evolving, adapting, right before our eyes. Thompson, with surprising strength, slammed me against a support beam. Pain flared in my ribs, the breath knocked from my lungs. He raised the snare, its glow intensifying. You fool! He bellowed, his voice barely audible over the creature's maddening shrieks. You'll doom us all! He aimed the snare at the writhing mass. I struggled to my feet, knowing this was the moment. It was a desperate gamble, the culmination of every doubt, every late-night vigil, every life lost to this hidden war. Just as Thompson activated the snare, I threw myself forward, tackling him to the ground. The snare device flew free, its energy discharge spiking wildly before fizzling harmlessly against the ceiling. The creature, deprived of its target, turned its unfathomable rage upon us. A tentacle slammed into Thompson, sending him flying across the room. Its form expanded, filling the space, becoming a monstrous parody of hunger and rage. I stumbled towards the discarded snare, my lungs screaming for air. The portal's pull intensified as the creature's raw energy destabilized it. In the reflection of a broken monitor, I caught a glimpse of myself. Bruised, battered, the lines between hunter and hunted blurring beyond recognition. Another tentacle lashed out, wrapping around my legs and yanking me towards the creature's impossible maw. My gun, dislodged in the struggle, skidded across the ruined floor out of reach. But I was a cleaner. Years of fighting monstrous shadows had taught me something about survival when there was nothing left to lose. I gripped the tentacle, using its momentum to swing my body upward, landing hard on the creature's exposed flesh. It felt like plunging into an icy, viscous nightmare. I fumbled for the snare, the creature thrashing and shrieking beneath me. With a final, desperate surge of adrenaline, I plunged the snare deep into its core. There was a blinding flash, a surge of inhuman energy, and then… silence. The creature convulsed, its form rippling and dissolving, leaving nothing but a foul-smelling residue on the floor. The portal sputtered, winking out of existence like a dying ember. The lab was a shambles. Thompson lay slumped against a wall, his breathing ragged. He locked eyes with me, recognition in his gaze. But there was something else there, too. A cold anger. A sense of betrayal. You... you ruined everything, he coughed, blood staining his lips. And you would have unleashed hell, I retorted, my voice raw. We dodged a bullet today. The sound of approaching footsteps filled the ruined lab. A squad of heavily armed agents stormed in, guns drawn. 
Their faces were masks of shock and suspicion as they took in the scene. What the hell happened here? barked the commanding officer. Thompson stood, his injured form straightening with a newfound dignity. An unfortunate accident, he said, his voice regaining a semblance of authority. But it's contained. And, Agent! He turned to me, his stare colder than the depths of space. Your report is long overdue. The ending, when it arrived, was anticlimactic. No disciplinary hearings, no clandestine firing squad. Thompson's version of the events, a lab accident, a creature running amok, his heroism in re-establishing containment, became the official narrative. I was just another name on the casualty list, my suspicions conveniently swept under the rug. The agency rumbled on. Davies was memorialized with a small plaque, his name added to the roll of honor beside so many others, their deaths attributed to the nebulous dangers of their profession. My nights remained haunted by the memory of the alien landscape, the stench of sulfur, and the dying shriek of a nightmare made manifest. But I learned to carry those demons in silence. A cleaner learns a lot of things. How to fight. How to survive. How to bend the truth when necessary. Because in the end, the darkness we battled resided not just in those monstrous parasites, but in the hearts of men like Thompson. Men who see opportunity in the abyss. And some wars, it seems, can never truly be won.